Hello, it's Mark here from Yokel Bear Reads. It's the 1st of August and I'm doing a birthday tribute to one of my favourites, if not the most favourite author of mine, who was born on this day in 1862. And that author is M.R. James, Montague Rhodes James, or as he was known to his friends, Monty. Um, and M.R. James, I guess it would be fair to say, is the father of the modern ghost story. Um, ghost stories have always existed, I think, throughout um, all cultures, at all times, ghost stories are featured. And certainly, if you go back, you know, into the mid-19th century, you had Charles Dickens writing ghost stories, Christmas Carol was a ghost story. But very often, they had these kind of gothic overtones. Um, they were set in big castles and um, and set in ancient times, or sometimes, as Dickens did, was turn the ghost story into sometimes a kind of comedy thing, um, or sometimes just morality tales. I mean, essentially, A Christmas Carol is a morality tale told through the medium of a ghost story. Um, but then M.R. James came along, and he started writing ghost stories that were different. They were fundamentally different in, in several respects. And what I would say about Monty is that he took the ghost story to the next level. And I first came across M.R. James when I was very young, uh, probably about, I don't know, nine, ten years old. And I picked up a, um, a copy of his collection of ghost stories, or, or uh, his most famous ghost stories. And they absolutely, at that age, unsettled me like nothing else. I'd never really had a reading experience like that before. Up till then, it was all kind of adventure and fantasy. But then I read these stories. They were fundamentally different because sometimes there wasn't a happy ending. And sometimes I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but there was just something deeply uncanny and sometimes wrong. It just felt wrong. There was a, there was a real feel of being unsettled. Um, and even though, as a child, you think that would be a really bad experience, for me, though, I was actually... I liked the kind of the pleasing thrill of these stories... I liked the goosebumps they gave me, and I was hooked. Um, ever since then, I've never not owned um, a collection of M.R. James's ghost stories. And the collection that I've got, which is, I think, is if you were going to buy one, this is probably the best one, which is the 100th anniversary edition called Curious Warnings, The Great Ghost Stories of M.R. James. Um, now, the interesting thing about M.R. James is is that he these ghost stories were his side project. He was actually a really well-known medieval, academ uh, medieval academic, studying you know the medieval times, biblical manuscripts, stuff like that. And he actually wrote these stories because he, um, he worked, first of all, at Eton and then at Cambridge, Cambridge University. And he would gather students and colleagues together at Christmas, normally on Christmas Eve, as something they called the Chit Chat Club, which was like they got together for probably brandy and something nice to eat. Um, and they would read each other stories or discuss academic papers. And at some point, Monty started writing ghost stories to tell as part of this Chit Chat Club. And it became a tradition that he would come with a new ghost story um, each year, or sometimes a couple of ghost stories. Um, and they then got published. And I don't think, I mean, certainly the stuff that I read, I don't think he ever really intended them to be published to start with. Um, he intended them just to be a bit of fun with some friends at Christmas. But published they were, and they became incredibly successful and incredibly influential. Um, a lot of his stories, there's a kind of Jamesian plotting that, or certainly in kind of the setup of the stories, 
very often you see very, very common things. Um, for instance, it's normally for then, for the time that they were written, a contemporary setting. Um, and an ordinary setting, an English seaside town, um, a country house, or sometimes just an ordinary house, or just an ordinary street. Um, and normally the protagonist would be a, a very nondescript and possibly naive gentleman or a scholar or a student. Um, now, one thing I will say, it's always men. And M.R. James is not really good with this. There's, there's very few women in here. Um, and I think it was very much a product of his time. And also as well, I mean, he worked in a kind of really all-male environment um, at public boys' schools and at university um, at the time that he was there. Obviously, he didn't admit many women, if any at all. So he worked in a very male environment. And I think his, his, very, his life was very male-orientated. Um, there is, I mean, he never married, um, as the obituaries say. Um, and there, there, were, there was speculation that he was a repressed um, gay man. And, you know, I think that's possible, but it's very, very difficult, you know, to look back and make that assumption. Um, but certainly he never appeared to have a relationship with a woman, never got married. So I guess you can read into that what you want. So there's not many women in this, which I think is a bit of a bit of a downside to um, the stories. But I will say the people that have been influenced and the authors that have been influenced um, have kind of taken the Jamesian elements of um, ghost stories and have protagonists that are really good women characters. So I think M.R. James set the ball rolling, but I think it was other authors that kind of got the gender balance and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> So you've got this contemporary setting and an ordinary nondescript person. But then what makes it supernatural is the discovery of some kind of old object or a book or something. Something that is actually a gateway or is the catalyst for unleashing something supernatural or attract that person then having... Um, unwanted attention from beyond the grave um, and very often some of these aren't actual ghost stories I mean ghosts feature in a good majority of them but sometimes these aren't actually ghost stories they're more stories of the uncanny sometimes in one there's kind of a monster um, in others you're not really sure what it is in one of his um, stories a whistle to and I'll come uh, come to you my lad is you think it's a ghost but actually when you read it again it might not be you're not quite sure it's just some malevolent malign force that by the simple act of blowing a whistle that um, he found a scholar is haunted by something but you really don't know what it is um the contemporary settings, I think, were really important. And M.R. James himself said he wanted his stories to make people think, if I'm not careful, something like this can happen to me as well. And that was what, what really, that's the big change that he made. Instead of the ghost story being some historical, gothic, romantic type thing, he actually placed them into people's lives and made you think, oh my God, this could be this could happen to me and the atmosphere that he he uses is incredible and that's the other thing that defines a Jamesian ghost story is the the atmosphere the sense of dread that builds the sense of the growing sense of unease and then there's always a crescendo but sometimes that crescendo isn't like revealing what the ghost is or what the monster is Sometimes the crescendo feels like you've pulled the curtain back to have a peek and then shut it again. You've got a glimpse of something. You've got a sense of something evil and malign, but you're not quite sure what it is. But you know you saw something, but you're not quite sure what it was. Um, 
like I said, he had a massive influence. M. R. Um, H. P. Lovecraft was a huge fan of um, M. R. James, and he he said this was one of the influences on his writing, and also so many other authors. I mean, obvious examples that come to mind are people like Susan Hill, who has written many many ghost stories that have this real Jamesian feel to them, but also as well people like Neil Gaiman as 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 said about how much of an influence these kind of short stories had on him. Um, so what are the best stories? Because obviously they're all short stories. Well, I'm going to tell you what my, my favourite ones are and also kind of what are the more accessible ones. Um, you have, as I've mentioned, O Whistle and I'll Come to You, My Lad, which is one of his most famous stories where the discovery of an, a strange whistle... Um, that is then blown into by the protagonist brings something malevolent into his life. You have the ash tree where an ancient curse means that there might be something really quite wrong living in the ash tree in the garden. You've got Canon Alberic's scrapbook about a a religious text or a religious um, icon um, a picture in a book may just be summoning demons you have the tractate midoth there's something really strange in the library a warning to the curious which is exactly that a warning to not go digging into things that should be left in the ground and one of my favorites is the fen the fen stanton witch which really speaks for itself but there are so many others in here the stores of barchester number 13 about um a man in a hotel room who suddenly realizes there's a room next door that wasn't there when he checked in um and a view from a hill which is about somebody looking through a telescope and seeing something that wasn't there when he looked with the naked eye these stories are absolutely perfect um, in their composition, in the way they build, in the way that they reach that crescendo. I'm doing this for, for Monty's birthday, which is in the height of summer. But if you really want to get the full effect of this, an autumn or winter night, read it by candlelight, read it with the lights out, read it after dark. Because these are absolutely made for those dark autumn and winter nights. Now, the stories themselves also inspired something else, which was um, some TV adaptations um, by the BBC in the UK during the 1980s. And then they kind of resurrected it again um, in the, the early 2000s. And again, it was that, that tradition, it was the M.R. James tradition of telling these stories at Christmas. They showed them at Christmas. I can remember when I was younger watching these on Christmas Eve. And again, and this is the, um, the collected from the British Film Institute. This is the collected, um, this is all of the ghost stories for Christmas. Um, which is, um, they're so unsettling. They're just like the novels. Uh, sorry, the novels, I said the novels, the short stories. They, watching these, they have a real weird, eerie and unsettling effect on you. But a pleasant one. It's a pleasing terror. As, as M.R. James once described his stories, he wanted them to be a pleasing terror. Um, and I, this is worth investing in. If you like spooky, weird television um, and something that's just, you know, it's not like some things are now, which is you, you get horror films and it's just, it's by the numbers. In these, sometimes it doesn't have a happy ending. And sometimes it doesn't really have an ending that you understand, but you enjoy getting there. Um, in terms of the editions of books that you can get, well, I mean, like I said, this is worth the investment um, but, you know, it's not a cheap book. I will say, this is the book that if I had a fire in my house, touch wood, and God forbid that happens, this is the book that I would grab first to save. This is my absolute favourite book that I own. 
but as you know this has everything this has every story plus some of the the non-fiction that mr james wrote about why he writes ghost stories and that's fascinating in itself but there's also a really good um vintage ed uh, edition of the kind of selected best ghost stories many of which is the ones that i've mentioned and i think it's worth if if you were going to start maybe pick up a copy of that and there are so many editions i think there's a new hardback edition from the british library have just done um a kind of selected stories um hardback so these are still in print and they're, they're, i think they always will be in print they're that good um but you can pick up lots and lots of different editions and and you know pick up these give them a try but maybe after dark maybe you know, with the lights out, dim lighting, candlelight, and ignore that strange scratching coming from the walls and the breath of the unseen person on the nape of your neck. Mm. Whilst we're talking of ghosts, I'm doing a one book haul as well, um, which is that I've got a hold of a copy of this. And it's, um, you know, as I said, I'm a huge fan of ghost stories. And I actually like just the, the premise of ghosts themselves. I am a sceptic. I don't necessarily believe in ghosts. I'd say I'm probably agnostic. That's the way to describe it. But I love kind of the, the cultural significance and, the, and what ghost stories mean. And I think ghost stories can tell you a lot about the times they were written in, what was going on, the history, the culture of the time. And I may do a video about that, about the different kinds of ghost stories in different cultures but i picked up a copy of this which is absolutely superb this is susan owens the ghost of cultural history now susan owens is an art historian who worked for the victoria and albert museum and so this is very much about um the cultural history in terms of art literature and how the ghost is featured in some great works of art in plays like i mean shakespeare hamlet there's a ghost um but also as well in literature so there's stuff in here about mr james and also loads of other people um that have written ghost stories and if you're really into kind of cultural history you know and um the history of art and history of literature this is an absolutely great read so that is my tribute to mr james happy birthday monty you have given me so much pleasure over the years and also scared the bejesus out of me um and long may that continue um so that's me done okay thank you very much bye